carbon nucleophiles. We've already discussed that terminal alkynes are more acidic than most hydrocarbons. Uh, the CH bond here, we can remove the proton so long as we have a decently strong base. The pKa for this proton is about 25. So as long as we have something, a base whose conjugate acid has a pKa greater than 25, that base should be strong enough to pull off the proton. We saw that green air reagents are strong enough bases to pull off this proton. Here we see an example where we use sodium amide. The amide will pull off the proton to form uh, ammonia and our acetylide anion. Uh, this is a carbanion, which can then be used as a carbon nucleophile to react with uh, an aldehyde or ketone. And here we're showing the acetylide reacting with acetone to form a bond between the carbonyl carbon and the alkynyl carbon. Here's the new bond that's been formed. Uh, we then have to work this reaction up with a source of protons. We only need a mild aqueous acid for the workup to protonate that negatively charged alkoxide. Uh, and we get these reactions in high yield. This is a very simple reaction, uh, but is a way to make these secondary and tertiary alcohols, which have uh, an alkyne group in the alpha beta position to the alcohol. Another source of nucleophilic carbon are ilids. Here we see three representatives of ilids. Ilids are neutral molecules, but they're dipolar. They contain a formal negative charge on the carbon and a formal positive charge on some heteroatom which is actually attached to that carbon. Typically we see sulfur, nitrogen, and phosphorus ilids. We're going to talk about phosphorus ilids. Specifically, we're going to talk about uh, this phosphorus ilid, which is also known as a phytic reagent. Notice we have a positive charge in the phosphorus, negative charge in the carbon. We can draw a resonance structure which just has a phosphorus carbon double bond, but the actual compound has a lot of negative charge character on carbon and a lot of positive charge character on phosphorus. With that negative charge character on the carbon, it can act as a nucleophile and uh, the lone pair of electrons can reorganize by attacking the carbonyl carbon. At the same time, uh, we might imagine that the electrons in the carbon-oxygen pi system reorganize to form a bond between the oxygen atom and the phosphorus of the phosphorus ilid to form uh, this four-membered ring intermediate known as a oxophosphatane. These are not very stable and they undergo a rearrangement of their electrons. Uh, here we see the arrow pushing to form a carbon-carbon double bond, we see from here, and a phosphorus-oxygen double bond, we see here. It is the formation of this phosphorus-oxygen double bond in the form of a phosphine, this being a triphenylphosphine. This is a very exothermic reaction and helps drive this whole reaction to completion, and we get a carbon-carbon double bond, an alkene compound. This is a very common way to make alkenes, uh, but let's think about how we make our phosphorus ilids. We typically use a trialkophosphine, very often triphenylphosphine. Uh, it's quite nucleophilic and it can react with a alkyl halide. We could really only do this reaction with primary and secondary alkyl halides. Uh, the secondary alkyl halides will undergo elimination if there's any protons on the carbons next to them. So that it's not very uh, often that we see that. When we get these reactions, we eliminate a halide and we get a triphenylphosphenium cation. Then we need to take a proton off of the carbon we just installed. We need a strong base to do that. Typically we'll use something like phenyl lithium, sodium hydride, uh, 
sodium amides, all of these may be strong enough to pull off that proton to form our phosphorus ilid. Here we see a specific example of triphenyl phosphine reacting with methyl bromide to form methyl triphenyl phosphonium ion. And then we react uh, phenyl lithium as our base to pull off one of the protons from the carbon next to the positively charged phosphorus to get our fitic reagent, our phosphorus ilid. Again, here we see the reaction. Uh, oops. Looks like this has been drawn as a concerted reaction to form this oxophosphatane intermediate, which is unstable and decomposes to produce an alkene and triphenylphosphine oxide. In this case, we've seen a terminal alkene because we used methyl bromide as our carbon source. There's another proposal for mechanism uh, that does a better job at explaining some of the products. So uh, here we see the whole mechanism. We take some trialkyl phosphate we react it with an alkyl halide to form our phosphonium salt. We then use a strong base to pull off uh, one of the protons on the carbon that I've circled to form our phosphorus ilid. The phosphorus ilid then we can, instead of the concerted reaction we showed previously, we can do our typical uh, carbon ion addition to the carbonyl group to form uh, something that's called a betaine. That betaine can have trans or cis configuration. Uh, what we see in the Newman projection is that there's a lot of steric interactions between that very bulky trialkyl phosphate group and whatever uh, alkyl group was uh, on the carbonyl carbon. So a lower energy conformation uh, has that alkyl group over here and anti to the triphenylphosphine group uh, that relieves a lot of steric strain. This is a more stable conformation, uh, much more likely to occur, and it ring closes to form those oxophosphatanes. And this pathway, the lower energy pathway, leads to the Z alkane, alkene. And the higher energy pathway leads to the E alkene. This additional intermediate, uh, by invoking it, it helps to give an explanation for the fact that these reactions very much favor formation of the Z alkenes. There's another derivative of the Wittig reaction known as the horner wadsworth emmons reaction. It's very similar. Uh, instead of a positively charged phosphorus though, we start off with uh, a phosphorus with a, that already has a carbon oxygen double bond. There's a lot of with electron withdrawing character uh, so that these protons on the carbon bonded to the phosphorus are slightly activated and can be pulled off with a strong base such as sodium hydride to form this negatively charged carbon ion. Uh, that carbon ion can then react with a carbonyl compound and we get the same types of uh, rearrangements, we'll see in just a second, to form a carbon oxygen double bond. So we end up removing two of these protons and this oxygen to form a double bond between the carbonyl carbon and the carbon that was formerly next to the phosphorus in the phosphonate ester. Let's take a look at this mechanism. So we form our anion. We use some strong base to pull the proton off of our uh, phosphonate ester to get this anion. And it then uh, is a good nucleophile and can attack the carbonyl carbon of an aldehyde or a ketone uh, to form this negatively charged intermediate, which will ring close to form uh, something that is very much like the oxophosphatane, a four-membered ring with a phosphorus oxygen bond that is somewhat unstable and it rearranges and 
kicks off, in this case, uh, a phosphite ester, a phosphite anion and our alkene. In this case, we get uh, the trans uh, product as well. Sorry, we get the trans product rather than the cis product. So that's the end of uh, what we want to talk about in terms of reactions. This is just to remind you that you will be having a midterm Wednesday, February 5th in Huggins 206. And take a look, we've covered all of these reactions either in class or in videos. Uh, so these are the reactions you're responsible for.